morning, I'm Daryl Jones, Director of Research at Hedgeye. Welcome to the Macro Show for November 23rd. Welcome to all the uh, new viewers today. We opened it up uh, to a broader audience. So just a reminder in terms of how the show goes, uh, Keith will go through sort of the markets, macroeconomics for 15 or 20 minutes, and we'll get into Q&A. Uh, we also are running right now Hedgeye on the Prize, which is a online trading competition with cash prizes. Uh, and we have a coaching session on that tomorrow at 10 a.m. But with that, I will turn over to Keith. All right. Uh, first thing we do in the morning are the top three things. When you look at everything, you have a go anywhere global macro strategy. That means we look at 50 different countries, all of commodities, all of credit, all of equities. Again, doing crypto as well. You have a go anywhere strategy. I try to boil it down to the top three things and I blow it out and review everything else. Top three things this morning in my notebook, number one, will be the two-year yield. It's a major move. I'm sure CNBC hasn't even mentioned it. Gold, number two, and then, of course, uh, the volatility of it all on the equity side. First, on the two-year yield. So just look at a chart. Uh, for those of you that don't do macro or haven't yet in rate of change terms, uh, now you know. So what happens in quad two? Uh, quad two is the only economic quad, and that quad is defined as growth and inflation accelerating at the same time. That is the only quad where short-term interest rates break out to the upside. Now, there was a dynamic here where there were a lot of people in the asset management community that trade bonds, trade rates, run money on the fixed income side, were betting on Brainerd. Wrong. Dead wrong. I didn't use an F-bomb. I'm keeping it clean for now. Dead wrong. I'd be dropping F-bombs if I, if I had that wrong that way. Uh, that's a terrible mistake. And again, it's compounding the return. So again, the bet was Brainerd would be more dovish than Powell. Now, Powell's back in there uh, for another term, and of course, people are expecting the Fed to get more hawkish as we go out in time, as the data does. So again, as the data continues to come in, we will continue to now cast it. We have the best predictive tracking algorithm in the Federal League, and we'll continue to tell you when inflation is or is not accelerating, all right? So that's a big point in the bond market, uh, obviously correlated to point number two, which is gold. Gold does not like quad two interest rates breaking out to the upside, never has. Never will. But I was getting run over for a little bit in this gold short because, of course, I was like, wow, yeah, you shouldn't have gold going up in quad two. Gold goes up in quad three. Look at the picture, okay? So here I'm showing you a chart of the 10-year yield against gold, okay? Quad three is when we had stagflation in the third quarter. Real growth was slowing. That's what quad three is, stagflation. So during that period, gold likes it. Bond yields on a relative basis are going down uh, relative to gold. And then, of course, we went into quad two where growth started to reaccelerate and gold does not like that. Okay. So again, that's a relative chart. It's a real simple chart when you look at it that way. Obviously, not a lot of gold bugs want to look at that, but I don't care what they want to look at. I want to get it right. I've, I've been long gold. I've been short gold and I like to go both ways, but I use my quads to instruct me. Gold's getting absolutely pounded here this morning, uh, down almost another full percent. So if you are short gold here, you own puts, I would be booking some gains because the 10-year yield's getting pretty close to the top end of the range, and that's a good leading indicator on that. 10-year yield, top end of the range is 167, and we're knocking on that door. On volatility, now, it's not just bond market volatility. Of course, you can see that yesterday, just classic quad, do, uh, quad two day if you look at cross-asset class volatility. Um, so again, something we pay attention to on the macro show every single morning. Again, this data doesn't go away people in this business do. So again, you go to 79, high 70s into the 80s on the move index. That's the second uh, row of, of pricing there. Um, that again, move index moves or treasury bond volatility, the equivalent of the VIX, just to make it simple, even though it's not simple, we're simplifying the complex for you this morning. Yes, we are. Uh, that when that happens in high yield OAS spreads fall, voila, it's quad two. Uh, but you also have uh, volatility across equities. People got really scared yesterday. Uh, so again, implied volatility. Now this is going to drive some of you for a complete loop because this is just numbers. No narratives, just numbers. Now, if you uh, have never seen numbers like this before, you're going to learn something. Uh, a big fat implied volatility premium. Go to the first column there where it says 81% on spies uh, versus a month ago where the, all those numbers were implied volatility discounts. We reviewed this on the macro show yesterday. We reviewed every single day. A month ago was time to sell because we we're near the top end of the range with implied volatility discounts. Implied volatility discounts imply complacency, okay? They imply capitulation by bears. Bears are covering. You know, whereas a big implied volatility premium means people are scared, like really scared, like buying puts type scared. 
And they should be scared because the hedge fund community is having a very scary month here. Uh, so what you see is a lot of books are getting eviscerated and shut down, taps on the shoulder from the bond market to the currency market and back again. It feeds. Again, that's why we do all of macro because, again, it's fractal. It's interconnected. So, again, the similar sets and the emergent properties, all big words. Uh, but, again, they're all in our model, and these are to be taken advantage of. So I think an 81% uh, implied volatility premium on SPIs means that we're going to make a new all-time high. Top end of the range on SPIs, all-time high. Uh, is 47.33, which is 1% above where uh, stocks closed yesterday. So again, we're looking for what I think will be the, uh, it's got to be the 65th or something, 66th all-time closing high of the year. And those are your top three things. All right, deal in probability space. Don't deal with the noise, okay? Good book, good book. The, the f most foundational book, or at least one of the top three books on, uh, on Hedge Eye University, if you want to go there and learn about the process, uh, you're going to find something like slide, a foundational slide, guys, uh, like you go to slide uh, five, I believe. Is it slide five where we have the Sierpinski gasket? So the top three things that I care about in our process are math, history, the time series of it all, uh, measuring and mapping all of it, and the behavioral overlays of the noise, okay? So behavioral psychology, the forefather of this was Daniel Kahneman. He wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, all right? And I want to challenge you. You know, I want to be your coach, right? I'm not the best coach in the league, but you know, th there aren't many alternatives. So unfortunately, you got to deal with me. I want you to challenge your premise and change what it is that you do. I'm always changing what we're doing. Again, if you do not change in this game, you will lose the game over time. So again, thinking fast and slow. See how you have to do both at the same time and remain sober? That's the point of the book. It's the title of the book. This book is dealing with all the noise in between. Excellent book. Again, goes across different parts of your life. And again, it's not unlike managing, risk managing the noise in your life. Think about that annoying teacher that's teaching your kid or that spouse that's about not to be your spouse. You know, there's a lot of noise. You either, you can turn it off. It's your choice, right? Get rid of the losers in your life and the losers on Wall Street and the losing strategies and get on with the winning side, okay? There's a lot of noise, but there's a lot of signal. So again, we're focused on signal. I don't care so much about why, over time, you're going to know why. Now we know why. Now we know why the biggest net long position in all of global macro was gold. Pop that on the table. Coming into this, coming into this Fed event on the announcement, Wall Street said, I'm betting on Brainerd. So see where gold has a 2.73 uh, standard, like that's a one-year Z-score. That's a huge bet. That's the biggest bet in macro. What was the wrong bet? Okay? So again, noise versus signal. Okay? Noise is categorically when people are wrong and wrong and wrong. Why would you listen to that? I mean, stay with a good process that has a high batting average and a high slugging percentage. Over time, you're going to do much better than reading other people's narratives, jumping from headline to headline like a macro tourist would. That's what it is. We're going from time series to time series, not from headline to headline. Headline is lagging. Time series is leading. Okay? Got it? I know you do. At least some of you do. Now let's get into the rest of the macro show. All right? So this is where my old friend, Jonesy Buds, and I remind you that the most bullish setup you can have in a market is when it says bullish trade, bullish trend, and bullish tail. Slide nine in the macro deck. That's my process. I made that up because I make everything I do up. So the people, when they copy it, it looks obvious that they're copying what we do. Okay? So, you know, or the quads, you see that on slide six? Like, what does that look like? Nobody's ever done anything like that other than us. I mean, people that copy it try, but the fact of the matter is, that's ours. Everybody knows that that's ours. So again, this is, and Jonesy Buds and I has this wonderful relationship. So when we say that it's a bullish trade, bullish trend, it's in your risk range product, it's, it's green, so it's very obvious. And when it's a big high or low, the low end of the range, every single day throughout quad two, pretty much uh, just generalizing here, for, uh, 46, 43. So that's big, high, or low, okay? Every day, if you're taking deliberate notes, deliberately studying, measuring, and mapping the data, you find a big high or low, and a higher, and this is a very technical term, um, for 47.33, which would be a higher all-time high only seen at Hedge Eye, Jonesy Butts. Okay? Now that part is our secret sauce. We got the Jonesy Butts. Okay? So you got that. You got my voice. It's raised because I'm singing a song. It's not like how I am in real life with my, certainly my three girls, maybe with Jack. <laughs> in practice, I do speak this way to Jack because he needs to be told succinctly and firmly, all right? I don't have time for all the other shit, all right? That came out of my mouth. 
Jonesy, apologize. Uh, let's look at the sector studies yesterday. If you look at the rest of the data, so that's what we do. Uh, don't forget that these, um, these, these levels, these risk ranges and, and, and signals are derived using a price volume volatility model. We're not going to be idiotic or, you know, 20 years ago looking at simple moving averages or moving monkeys, as we affectionately call them, because that would be a one-factor model. You would never do that. Uh, if you're educated mathematically, obviously. Uh, these are the sectors. So yesterday, yesterday, one of the worst sectors you can be in, which unfortunately I haven't nailed on the short side, I'm not long it, thank God, communications. So that communications back tests as a short or an underweight in quad two. So when you look at slide eight, which is the historical back test by quad, and this is why uh, a rules-based process, again, the signal leads it, so you don't just get wed to that picture like a, an amateur would. That's very attractive, that picture, but it would be a real rookie mistake to not have a volatility-adjusted signal that, again, uh, superimposed on this, leading this, so that you, you, this is just a starting point. This is a starting point. So again, I don't want to reduce uh, everyone to saying, okay, everyone has to start here, but the fact of the matter is being aware of that is real important, and communications are uh, one of the biggest underweights, whereas something like tech and consumer discretionary are the top two overweights in quad two. And what's really interesting is if we go to quad one in the first quarter and the market starts to discount, it may be doing that already, it's still the top two. So again, when you look at the sector styles, those are weighted for expected return, a quarterly expected return uh, by sector style, asset class, et cetera, is that slide eight. Uh, just uh, looking, uh, moving along here, it was a good day, obviously, for uh, yesterday for, uh, for energy stocks. We'll see what happens there today. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. Uh, inside information galore on Biden releasing, uh, releasing the 50 million barrels ahead of Thanksgiving, so you can just kind of go on a break or whatever. I, I can, don't call me political. I didn't like pump and I don't like Biden. I don't like either party. I like to make money. So again, what we got to do is front run these guys. So again, understand that the market always does that. So if you're looking for a reason, why, 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 why did oil correct? Well, because all these guys came in a COP26 with inside information. We're going to, we're going to announce to the world ahead of Thanksgiving that there really is no inflation, even though, uh, well, there is inflation. Remember that? There's no inflation, so I wouldn't do this to the SBR because if I thought that there was no inflation, I wouldn't have to do that. But now you get, you get the, you get the drill. All right, what else do I got going on for you this morning? Uh, volume yesterday, uh, if you look at it relative to what it was. So we measure and map the price, volume, and volatility up 11% versus the prior day. It was a big day for hedge funds, I think. Again, taps on shoulders, big moves, getting rid of things, getting rid of managers, by the way. There's a lot inside, uh, inside the game there, in addition to what I talked about on the positioning of Brainerd versus Powell. But that's all yesterday's news. You got to get on to the next game. No matter what you think could, should, or would have happened, this is what's happening. Deal with what is happening as opposed to what could happen. That'll change your life. I know it will in the market. Again, you can scare the living shit out of yourself. Second square shit. Third, man, hat trick, Jonesy. <laughs> but I have not. I've not dropped an F-bomb. I'm cleaning up. All right? Again, this is the, if you want to go read Zero Edge, you can be completely freaked out and miss quad two, and that's on you. Right? You waste precious lifetime reading this scary stuff. Uh, when you could just be celebrating the joys of quad two and all-time highs. So again, I'm not a perma bull. I'm certainly not a perma bear. I go both ways, and I like it. And that's what an objective, data-driven, apolitical process should do. Okay? Got that? Write all that down. I worked on that one-liner. I don't have a teleprompter. What else we got going on for you this morning? Uh, we have uh, Asia. So if you look at it, what happened in Asia last night? Well, Japan was closed. Uh, China is at the top end of the range, so start buying some more puts or buying some protection on China. If you go back to that implied vol table, you can see that if you look down that column on the current implied, implied volatility premiums and discounts, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. China. See how China doesn't have a big fat one? You know, so it's a good time to short a stock or buy puts, in this case buying puts on the ETF, if it's A at the top end of the range, and B has a benign or implied volatility discount, something that's closer to flat, okay? Good little uh, pro lesson there, pro tip. It's not a stock tip, that's a pro tip. Uh, on the other side of that, we continue to make money on the short side of Hong Kong. I was shorting more yesterday. Um, Southbound connect volumes, which again, when you look at the Chinese and what they're doing to Hong Kong, it's really a disaster. And again, I'm not gonna get into the politics of it all, but both are slowing, okay? Both countries are slowing. That's why we have them. If you look at slide, um, if you look at slide 23, you can see that we have both Hong Kong and China in the bad quads. The bad quads are color-coded, yellow and red. Stay away from the yellow and the red lights, particularly the equity market when that happens. Um, and again, this, <clears throat> we started making this call at the beginning of the year, so we're not like Johnny come lately here. Uh, but south, southbound connect uh, outflows in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong's now down 5.7% in the last month. So that's been a wonderful short against all of our longs. 
uh, in the U.S. in particular. Uh, South Korea was down another half a percent. Uh, the Kospi remains one of our top three shorts. So again, we do have shorts. The difference between ours and the people that have been calling for a 10, 12, 20 percent correction on Wall Street uh, on the U.S. stock market is that our shorts are actually accurate. Okay, so again, that's important. I've been short selling for over 20 years. Uh, again, I've made as many mistakes as anybody's going to make in, in the public sphere and timestamp. Everyone, you can look them all up. Uh, but currently, we're not wrong on short Hong Kong uh, and short South Korea. We are long of India, which we were wrong on yesterday because it went down, and now it's going up. So today, we get to be right again. Being long India has been nothing short of fantastic relative to short China. So there's a lot of different ways to find alpha or to generate, you know, generate positive alpha, positive, absolute, and relevant returns in your accounts. If you just set up long India against short China, you'd be quite happy with the result this year, obviously. What else? I got um, uh, finally a big bounce in Russian stocks after the Ukraine news uh, hit the tape and oil stopped going down. See how that worked. So again, that's, a, that's an oil market. By the way, Russia is, is still bullish trend. I gave you the level yesterday. Now the trend, uh, these numbers change. Trend signal is 1616 on the Russian trading system index. By the way, Norway broke trend uh, this morning. We'll see if it can recapture the trend. The biggest problem for something in your portfolio is when it goes from bullish trend to bearish trend. So pay very close attention to those. Uh, Poland is a good example of one where I just got my ass kicked. Uh, and again, ass is in the swear. It's like a donkey. It's like Mr. Wonderful. Okay, so that's what it is. And Poland broke trend. So that's what. Not so. That's the question. Do you stop yourself out? Do you tell yourself you're right? I tend to reduce the position in terms of size, and then if it confirms a trend breakdown, I stop myself out. Okay. Uh, European equities continue to look very good away from that. Uh, Germany at the low end of the range. You should be buying more of that. Uh, these are all published, you know, the DAX is published, the risk range is published. Uh, France still looks good. Uh, it's had a good month. Isn't that interesting relative to the prevailing narrative? The narrative is, oh my God, Austria locked down, whereas the market says, oh, interesting, buy Germany and France. And the Dutch, EWN, is the Netherlands. Why is that? Is the market front running the future? That COVID cases are going to, in the future, slow down from current levels? Me think so, Mr. Fractal Signal. Ooh, it's like Mr. Miyagi, out there, like big time. All right, uh, commodities already done that. Gas is up, natural gas being uh, up 4%. Uh, don't chase the ace there. You got to buy it at the loan of the range, just like anything else, and sell some when it's green. Uh, oil's risk range, just like a champ. 75.13 is the loan of the range. It hit that right on the screws ahead of the news and went right back up. Our Bitcoin tracker continues to do the same thing. We publish all these every single day. Uh, risk range, loan of the risk range on Bitcoin, which I do consider a commodity in my framework because it has the same volatility attributes as a commodity. It's not something personal against maxis. It's risk management. It's called hedge eye risk management because we risk manage longs. We don't hodl, okay? Yeah, we can hold a position throughout the cycle. The only quad to not be long, grossly long, Crypto is in quad four. We're currently not in quad four. Obviously, I continue to say quad two. Uh, copper back above the trade and trend line. That's bullish. Corn ag across the board continues to be bullish trade and trend. And did I say gold is, is back to bearish trend on the signal? Indeed, I did. Uh, Ten-year yield low into the range. Oh, just similar set here. So we go 10-year yield. See this? We're going to go all fractal on you. Let's go a little Jonesy buds, yell blue, even though they lost to Harvard in the game. Um, Ten-year yield. 1.50%. That's one of the most important numbers. These two numbers are big higher lows. That in fractal math would be called a similar set. Things that happen at the same time that are causal, again, perpetuating the economic reality that is quad two. Quad two, growth and inflation accelerating at the same time. Let's take some questions. Okay, uh, here we go. This is Mike from Vancouver. What are the top three commodities by signal strength or I guess, you know, what's what sort of at the top of your list in commodity space? Uh, number one uh, number one currently uh, is coffee, followed by wheat. And I would go with um, what are, a, a corn's right behind it. So it's really um, the softs uh, are strongest from a signaling perspective, which shouldn't be a huge conceptual surprise, Jonesy, because energy had inside information that needed to be risk managed. There was volatility in it. Uh, by the way, back on oil, the risk range on the vol of vol. Let's do that. Vol of vol. So all these things, all these ranges are derived using a vol of vol. What is vol? Not Tennessee volunteers. This is vol of vol, the volatility of volatility. So now you're thinking like a modern day macro risk manager that actually uses fractal math instead of moving monkeys, okay? So again, when you look at OVX, which is the volatility of oil volatility, uh, when I look at the volatility of that and measure and map it, 
the risk range on that's like 32 to 39. So when the vol gets to the top end of the range, the price is usually at the low end of the range. That's what gives me my, my dynamic risk range. And again, other people have tried to copy it, but it's really hard because I'm the one who, this is one of the things uh, that nobody could steal, right? Because I, I, the only one who's seen this is actually Jack McCullough, and he's 14 years old. So again, um, so this is, I keep this one very close to the vest, and I operate it. So you need somebody, it's just like, um, I don't know, Formula One. You, know, you can put somebody in a car, you can steal a car, but who can drive it? Right? So again, understanding all these shifts, gear shifts inside out uh, in these tight, what, what John Boyd, the mad major, would call. You think I swear. The mad major, look him up. He changed the U.S. military. He'd smoke like a chimney. He'd swear like a sailor. And he would do it when he would be confronted by officialdom, people who just don't want to change. Right? So again, in these OODA loops, you've got to make OODA loop is observe, orient, decide, and act. Right? And if you don't act, when you're in a dogfight with a South Korean jet, you're going to die. We don't want to die, that's for sure. I was going to make a point on oil. Um, you know, obviously up today, even though the, the release from the uh, SPR. But, you know, and we sort of saw this with China earlier in the year. But the reality is, you know, 50 million barrels is less than three days supplied or d demand in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So they're really not doing anything to the market, right? It's, it's a, they think it's a signal, but it's, you know, fundamentally, is, you know, basically irrelevant. So you took the number of barrels and you divided by what marginal impact would be? Yeah. And That's why, you know, who's he like? Like, <laughs> I haven't gone all lead tasso on you guys, but this is beer. This is beer. Why do you think we promoted, look at Gendron in there. He's on the switch. He's one of the best macro traders now of the modern era. You know, like, can you imagine how many guys that this guy's outperforming? He can flip back and forth on macro charts like nobody. No, nobody does it like Genron does. Genron, show that gift that we use today to promote Jonesy. We're trying to subtly give Jonesy a little bump here into the holidays. You know, just nice, I like it. Jonesy signal, single, like beard. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Yeah, don't they look the same? Go back to Jonesy. I like it. If you put on some, it may be a little bit. <laughs> All right, a uh, few questions on Ivol. Uh, this is Rick M. from Boynton Beach. Happy Thanksgiving, Coach. What does your process say about Ivol? Dividend approaching, perhaps at the low end of the, of the range, realizing not, not part of the risk range is provided. How are you positioned, out completely, or looking to add some? I'm out completely, and you know that, because uh, you wouldn't be asking the question if you didn't know that. When I sold all my Ivol, which is Ivol, they're asking about Nancy Davis's quadratic interest rate volatility inflation hedge, which is, you know, generally works when the yield curve's steepening. So again, when my signal said that we've taken out that view, again, you're going to stop steepening when people are making these stupid ass bets on, on Brainerd, right? Now that they've stopped making that bet, maybe we got peak, peak um, compression in the yield curve because the short end moved faster than the long end. Um, currently, yes, eyeball because the short end moved like that, it took, so if you take the 10-year yield minus the two-year yield, it's only 100 basis points wide. It just came in by 10 basis points in a New York minute on that Brainerd news, non-Brainerd news. So again, that's where eyeball gets oversold because the curve compresses. Curve flattens, eyeball gets oversold, the ETF does. And I, I got no problem with you for a trade buying it into the distribution. You gotta be a little careful with that when you're hunting for distributions, coupons, and bond market, et cetera. But I, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dissuading you from what you're thinking about doing because it's at the loan of the range and that's generally where in your OODA loop, again, in the very short term, where you're going to observe, orient, decide, and act, you certainly wouldn't be selling eyeball here, so why not buy some and get your distribution? They have a nice little distribution that they pay uh, into the end of every month. Okay, this is uh, Mohammed from Dubai. Hello, Coach. What are the implications when the VIX reaches any end of the risk range without the S&P getting to the corresponding end of the risk range? Is an indicator that the risk range, risk range have changed as quick as the VIX move, or is it just an implication that this move is episodic? Thanks as always. Episodic and non-trending. That's exactly what I would read it through to be. Uh, you know, the trend in the VIX would change if you were to get volatile or the volatility of the VIX to go back above trend. So that's not happening. You're going to have to get it above like 27 for that to happen. You know, what happens in Quad Two is that the VIX goes from you know, basically, you know, a very challenging chop bucket is what we call it, between 20 and 30, into the teens, which is a, about as bullish as bullish gets. Now, what could happen here, Jonesy? I had a lot of questions from institutional clients on this yesterday. They're like, 
because people are trying to front run me on going from quad two to quad one. I'll get there on my own sweet time. Again, or not, I, you know, I screw things up all the time, just like anybody else, I'm just you know, accountable to it. Um, but currently, like if we go from quad two to quad one, the VIX can go to 10. In most bull markets, actually, that's where bull markets end. They, they end at VIX 10, not at some super duper valuation over valuation model that people keep pitching to you. They end when the volatility can't go down anymore. Got that? Write that down, right? I teach 10 year olds, actually every 10 year old, 11 year old, 13 year old, 14 year old, because I don't coach 12 year olds, that I coach, when I show them the video board, we, we coach visually, they have a notebook, they have the exact same notebook. I've created a bunch of clones. Yeah. And you go to the rink and they have the same notebook. And I say, write that down. Volatility determines the end of a bull market, not valuation. Okay? Valuation is not a catalyst. The volatility of volatility is the number one catalyst. And if we go to quad one, look at the expected value in quad one of everything that ticks. I'll circle it just so that you can draw your eyes to go on slide uh, seven. Um, these are the numbers behind the words on slide eight that we showed you. What would you buy in each quad? Okay. Again, you can only get this here. So if you want to go get it somewhere else, you're gonna. It's like it's like going to McDowell's instead of McDonald's. Um, so here we go. So right here, see quad one. Look at these are the expected returns. Look at these things. These are like six, sevens, eights, nines. Tech's expected return in quad one is nine percent. See that? Tech nine. Even the stuff that sucks, like utilities, is up three and a half. So if you thought that this bull market has annoyed you, if you're listening today because I annoy you, I love it. Because you're going to continue to be annoyed by the economic realities of the quads. If we go to quad one in Q1, you've seen nothing yet. We've seen 65, 66 all-time closing highs in the S&P 500. All these, we had a trifecta of closing highs on November the 8th, uh, which included the Russell. Now everybody's crying because the Russell's down 4.5%. Buy the Russell. Got that? Was it clear? Buy it. All right? Because in quad one, <laughs> whoa, you know, everything's going up. And we've already seen everything go up. You know, it was only two days ago that the NASDAQ made its, um, again, if you're writing it all down, you would know this. This is what my notebook looks like if you want to take a little peek. Is this guy full of shit or what? Annoying? No. Look, this is the 46th all-time closing high of the NASDAQ. That was not even 48 hours ago. And people are losing their shit because it has a down day and buying protection. You're going to have the 47th, the 48th, the 55th. If we go to quad one, this thing is going to howl at the moon. And it's already doing so. So again, get on the right side of it. Don't get upset with me. It's not my fault. How I speak is, is my, it's my parents' fault. <laughs> okay. Actually, uh, my mom. My mom. No. <laughs> if, you, if you met my mom, she's the most lovely, wonderful, you know, polite human being ever. She'd be, uh, you know, she's, I should not blame my parents for this. Uh, Terrace from Cleveland. Good morning, Coach and Jonesy. What is uh, the, you know, we haven't, I don't know if we've talked about this one in a while. What's the signal strength showing on EWN, which is the Netherlands, and where do you rank it against other countries? Uh, good, good question. Is it, is good it, question. It still bullish trend. Thank you. All right, let's go to. Uh, can you guys take me to slide uh, twenty? Take me to slide twenty. So this, um, when I'm talking about these slides, like we currently in this um, macro slide deck for Macro Pro subscribers, we currently have one hundred and twenty-seven slides in this deck. One hundred and twenty slides of unadulterated content. Think about it. Not words, numbers. And on this page, what do we got? We got numbers. All right. Now, um, we do not have the Netherlands on here, but let's, let's use the Eurozone as the example instead. We can, I mean, come back here. Bring me back there, okay? Um, so we go Eurozone as an example. So you got Q4, Q1. These are the, you know, the, the quad that we're in is quad two, going to quad one, which is the best quad that you can be in for Europe. Okay, I just talked about that on the USA, not, not dissimilar from the USA. And you might say, oh my God, look at on this thing, it says quad four. No, I'm front running my own model. Like I've done for the last year, when these two numbers used to be fours as well, but now they're threes and twos, okay? Threes and twos. So here you go. Now you have signal strength. So I, I go to Europe, okay, what in signal strength terms uh, are, are the, the things that are signaling higher highs, like I said at the beginning, big higher lows, higher highs, 
and those define signal strength. If it's signaling lower highs, it's, it's got less signal strength, okay? Could be in a consolidation, doesn't mean it's bearish, it just means that it's less bullish. So currently this morning uh, in Europe, in terms of, let's rank the top three, top three are EWG, EWN, which is um, the Dutch or the Netherlands, and EWQ. If I went to a month ago, those three were in the bottom three, and the top three European signal strengths included things like Russia and Norway. Why? Why, 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 why? Because oil was at 85 at the end of last month when everyone was chasing it, and those are more correlated equity markets to the price of oil. So again, they've moved down the list. These economies have moved up the list as we continue to get quad two data in Europe. And uh, we didn't touch on this, but we got some, I guess, incremental acceleration in, in Eurozone uh, PMI. PMIs this morning. I don't know if you hit on that already, but yeah, they look pretty good. Yeah, pretty well, they, good across the board. They continue to accelerate despite COVID lockdowns. And you know, the news will get you petrified. Again, I had this, uh, what I thought was a pretty good tweet last night. I said, you know, something about, oh my God, the Russell is, or the, the NASDAQ is about to collapse after making its all-time high. Click here for, you know, for, to, to be freaked right out, clickbait.com. You know, think of all the media sources that you use. Most of them are political. I think most people uh, will acknowledge that. At a bare minimum, they're political. So again, they're either on the right or they're on the left. I can use my right, I can use my left, whatever. It's noise. How many channels actually give you an objective, data-driven market view? Now, the only thing worse than having a political view that is totally on the right or totally on the left or totally on the left and totally on the right is having a market view that is, right? So that's terrible. You know, so what you want to do is you want to measure and map the data. We have 80 people. We think we need probably 120 to 150 to do this like a lot better globally. Some people think that they could just wake up in the mo morning with like just one human being born to do this, right? The Tom Brady's of finance. You know, they can, you can't do that. You can't, I, well, at least I'd like to play against you if you think you can do that. Like, if you're Kramer's Investing Club, like, good luck. Like, seriously, good luck. If you're a part of it, good luck. If you're not going to be back tomorrow because it's not free, that's fine. I wish you luck. I want to play against you. Uh, because this is a really tough job that you need a lot of players to be executing. On our macro team now, we have seven going on, eight people. Uh, again, this isn't just me singing the song. This is obviously a tremendous team with great talent, analytical wherewithal, mathematically speaking, to, again, deliver the wood every morning so that I have something to say that's tangible, actionable and accountable because obviously if I think it's tangible and actionable it's not always going to be right so again it can be wrong and it will be wrong and when it's wrong we're not going to stay wrong we're going to either stop ourselves out or find a better way so again there's a lot to do here thank you for um, thank you for joining us I appreciate it yep thanks everybody for joining today uh, have a great day out there we're back at it tomorrow morning at 9 a.m and uh, co coaching session tomorrow at 10 tomorrow at 10 thanks